back together as those who love one another, those who care about one another, those who are brothers and sisters in Christ. Simple, but it's not easy. I think that's what I'm calling this morning. This morning. It's a simple concept, but it's not easy. Lots of things are, are, are simple and aren't, aren't easy. Um, the concept of losing weight is, is simple but not easy. It's calories in and calories out. It's you eat less and exercise more. But that's not, it sounds simple, but it's, it's not easy or people wouldn't be making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on diet foods and pills and plans and programs if we found it easy to, to do those kinds of things. So, what is it that Jesus wants us to do? He wants us to be reconciled to each other. We said that. He wants us to love one another. We said that. So how do we do this? Well, Jesus in the scripture lesson this morning in Matthew 18 gives us an understanding of how we should receive. It's kind of a four-step process. Uh, hopefully never getting to step four, but it's a four-step process. First, you go to your Christian brother and sister and try and talk it out. You don't go again determined to win. You, don't, you do go in love. You go with an open mind. You go with the goal of working out this, this problem of, of seeing if you can't come to some resolution. Some reconciliation. That is the whole point. But if that fails, Jesus says that we should take one or two other Christians with us to be a part of the conversation. Two other people from the body of Christ. And maybe this can help with the reconciliation. The idea here is not to gang up on somebody. The idea is to bring two of your best friends that agree with everything you've said and you've already kind of spun them up on what, how lousy the other person is. No, the idea is to bring two people who are outside the conflict that are good, solid Christians that can sit there unbiased and listen to the conversation and help shape reconciliation. Help begin to bring people back and remind them of the whole point of the conversation and that's to come together in the grace and love of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if that fails, then we're told we should take it to the church. We, we should uh, bring it to the church. Now, we don't do this very often, and, and probably most people don't even know that we have a method within the church to do this. Uh, the United Methodist Church does have a method within the church to do it, and, and uh, perhaps the people on that committee don't even know that yet. Uh, so look for shot look on faces from people on the Pastor Parish Relations Committee. But anyway, um, their, one of their roles is to help with conflict within the church. A lot of people think of the Pastor Parish Relations Committee and the Staff Parish Relations Committee as just a personnel committee that deals with uh, uh, job descriptions and, and, uh, and uh, salaries and, and things like that. But they're also there for conflict resolution. For if, if there's a conflict not only between the pastor and somebody else in the congregation, but if there's a conflict with other people in the congregation that's, that's been brought to the church, it's the pastor parish committee that's a very that's a, uh, an extremely confidential committee that's to be in place to help people wrestle with their issues and help them be able to come to a resolution that both benefits them and the church and really brings reconciliation and love back into the picture. It's hard for us to, to do these kind of things, but it is the process that, that Jesus himself has pointed out to the church when dealing with conflict. The final step, which is the one I hope that we never have to get to in, in any kind of conflict situation, but that is if everything else fails. Jesus says this, and these are Jesus' words, not mine. Let that person be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, stay away from them. Leave them alone. Walk on the other side of the street. It sounds harsh, but it's what Jesus calls us to do. If the, you've got to realize the conflict can bring an entire church down. The conflict can destroy the entire body. And, and if the conflict cannot be resolved by, this, by the first three steps of this method, which is all about reconciliation, all about understanding what the problem is and trying to love one another through the issue. If we can't do that, then the, whoever is decided by the church is the one that's causing the issue, um, they're asked to, to be removed. And we don't usually think of excommunication in, in the Protestant church. Um, and again, I hope we never have to deal with anything like that. But that's the process that Jesus lays out for us. It's simple, but it's not easy. I think another point that uh, is uh, quickly forgotten is, is that one of the passages we love to quote uh, when uh, there's just a couple of us that show up for a committee meeting or maybe a Bible study, and we say, well, you know, where two or more are there, yeah. 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 there I am also, there I am with you, there's different ways to end that, uh, but there I am, for two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them, 
it's how it's been done in the New Revised Standard Version in this. We forget that that's a part of Jesus' conflict resolution passage. This is all a part of the section where Jesus is talking about church discipline. And we forget that. We, we, we forget that that's really what it's not about a Bible study meeting. It's not about a, 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 a committee meeting or anything like that. It's about conflict resolution. When we are doing conflict resolution in, in Jesus' name, it means we're going with the proper attitude of love. It means we're remembering that the whole point is reconciliation, not victory over the other person or proving I'm right and wrong, but how we love each other in the name of Jesus Christ. When both people come with that kind of attitude, Jesus promises to be there among you also. He's part of that resolution. He's part of that conflict resolve. And I'll tell you, when we come in a way where Satan is in the lead and we decide, you know what, it's all about me and I'm going to get my way, I don't care what, and this person did something wrong to me, so I'm going to make them pay for it, Jesus is probably far away from that room as he can possibly be. And we can't really expect solid conflict resolution to come out of those kind of attitudes. The final step I'd like to add, and it's not that I'm adding something to, to what Jesus said, I believe Jesus has probably got a better idea about this than I do. But Jesus said something else that I was reminded of as I was looking at this and something that we might want to keep in mind as we're doing conflict resolution as well. And that is this, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Persecute you. That's out of Matthew 5. And um, not that we should relate necessarily our brothers and sisters in the church as enemies. I hope we don't mean that. But the person on the other side of the issue, uh, again, we should be praying for that person. It changes, it softens our heart, it helps us to, to remember that God loves them just as much as God loves us. Uh, it, it, it's a wonderful thing to be able to pray for the person that you're angry with and allow that to, to really bathe over you, uh, to force yourself to do it. That's why Jesus says to do it. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It changes us. And prayer is powerful, it can change the other person too. But the most important person that changes in that situation is it changes us. It allows us to have the attitude that gets us into that room with the person to allow us to try and seek reconciliation. So I think that's another important thing to add to this, this already uh, very simple and understandable way of, of working through resolution, conflict resolution in the church. Now, I understand when things happen and people get angry, uh, we're not thinking, you're probably not going to think about and remember a four-point plan of how I'm going to do conflict resolution. Matter of fact, when you're angry, you probably won't be able to find Matthew 18 in the Bible. Okay, uh, remember that that's where this came from. Uh, and I understand that as, as well. So the biggest takeaway that I want you to have from the message this morning is what we're trying to get to. What is the goal of what we've been talking about? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. The goal is to be reconciled to one another. The goal is that we might love each other. We know that as brothers and sisters, grew up with brothers and sisters, as I said, there's going to be times when there's, there's problems. And as I say in my pre-marriage counseling, whenever you put two adults in the room, there's going to be an argument sometime down the road. Uh, it, it just happens. We know that there's going to be conflict. But remembering the important thing, and that is we are the body of Christ. We represent Christ to the world. And the goal is that we live in a reconciled state with God and with, what, and with one another. Two commandments that we talk about almost every Sunday because it's always relevant to every sermon. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, and mind, and soul, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Simple, but not easy. If we remember to try and love the person with whom we're angry and to go to that person in love to work out our differences, then God will bless us, God will bless this church and this community, and God will bless this, this congregation as well.